really into the study of the Word, and it's an exciting thing. Uh, in our class this morning, we are going to study the lesson on the mark of the beast, and it's found on page 213 of your syllabus, and so I invite you to turn there to page 213 of your syllabus, and uh, we are going to try and finish this lesson uh, in the one hour where we begin our class this morning. And then we're going to turn to Daniel 11 and eventually to Revelation chapter 17. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get right into our study. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for life this day, for the beautiful sunshiny day. And we just ask, Father, that the sunshine of Jesus will shine in our hearts and in our minds that we might understand what we're going to study. Not only understand it, but apply it and share it. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. As we begin, I want you to imagine throwing a stone into a lake. And the stone, when it hits the water, it causes three ripples. One ripple is the larger one. The next ripple is smaller. And the third ripple is the smallest, working from outside in. The smallest ripple broadens into the large one, and the larger one uh, merges into the largest one. Now I want you to imagine three concentric circles. We're going to apply this illustration now to what we're going to study about the mark of the beast. We have, we're going to study in this lesson three aspects that deal with the seal of God. We're going to begin with some general remarks, then we're going to be more specific, and then eventually we're going to go to the fourth commandment and be very, very specific. So let's take a look at the largest circle uh, in the largest ripple, if you please. And basically what it is is that the final conflict is going to be over the law of God. It's going to be over the Ten Commandments. So that, that is the largest uh, ripple, the largest circle. It's a general, you know, because uh, the Ten Commandments are Ten Commandments. So is there a specific commandment that the conflict is going to be over? Well, we're not going to deal with that as we begin. We're just going to look at the fact that the final conflict has to do with the Ten Commandments. Then we're going to specify that it has to do with the first table of the law. And finally, we're going to see that it has to do with the fourth commandment in the, fourth ta in the first table of the law. So we're going to notice several points under each one of these ripples, so to speak. Uh, the first point that I want you to notice is that Satan hates the commandments of God at the end of time. The Ten Commandments, generally speaking. It says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went, went to make war with the rest of her offspring, or the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what does Satan hate at the end of time? He hates those who keep the commandments of God. It doesn't specifically say which one is at issue at the end, which is the particular commandment where the conflict is, it simply says that Satan hates the commandments of God. Point number two, God's people at the end will have the seal where? On their foreheads. And it is the law of God that is written on the forehead or in the mind. Let's notice Revelation 7 verse 3, first of all, where we're told that the seal is placed on the forehead in Revelation. It says there, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God, where? On their foreheads. So notice the forehead. What's behind your forehead? Your frontal lobe, your mind, your reasoning, your thinking. Notice Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10, where God writes His law. It says there in Hebrews 8 verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my what? Ah, there it is. I will put my laws in their mind. That's the forehead. And write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, 
and they shall be my people. So once again, the law of God is written on the mind, on the forehead, if you please. And then point number three, we notice that we are told specifically that it is the law that is sealed among God's disciples or Christ's disciples. It says in uh, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So seal and law go together, don't they? I want you to notice also point number four. This is a very interesting point. Those who have the seal of God depart from iniquity. It is the law that defines good and evil, doesn't it? The law defines what is good and evil. You can read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, whether it is good or whether it is what? Whether it is bad. So the law of God defines what is good and what is evil. Now there are two texts that I want us to compare. One is Matthew 7, verse 23, and the other is Luke 13, verse 27. They're very similar. They're actually uh, the same saying of Jesus in different Gospels. And uh, before we read those two verses, I want to read one other, which is 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 19. And then we're going to compare 2 Timothy 2, 19 with these two texts from the Gospels. It says there in 2 Timothy 2, 19, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. Now, what is the seal? The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So, what is the seal? It is departing from what? It is departing from iniquity. Now, that word iniquity is the Greek word adikia. Uh, I want you to, to, to put that in the corner of your mind for now because we're going to come back to it. It's the word adikia, iniquity. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23, and then we'll look at Luke 13 and verse 27. Now, before we read those two verses, let me just mention that in the Greek, when you have a noun and you put an a before the word that, this, that is the noun, it means against or it means contrary to. So, the, for example, the word uh, in Greek for law is nomos. But if you want to say that someone is against the law, you say anomos. You put an A. Now, I want you to notice, uh, be, because dikia would be righteous. Adikia would be unrighteous so or iniquitous uh, keep that in your mind Matthew 7 verse 23 says and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you who practice what lawlessness that's the word anomias now uh, it's very important to realize uh, that in uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23, the word that is translated lawlessness is the same word in 1 John 3, 4, where it says that sin is the transgression of the law. You see, the old King James Version, the, the original King James, says uh, transgression of the law. The new King James says lawlessness. So the word anomias means someone who is against or contrary to what? Contrary to the law. But now I want you to notice uh, Luke chapter 13 and verse 27, a very similar saying of Jesus, but he does not use the word anomias. And by the way, you need to make a correction in your syllabus uh, where it says Luke 13 verse 27. You notice at the end of the verse that I quote, it says anomias in brackets. It's really adikia. It's the word in 2 Tim Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. So you need to make that correction. Uh, notice Luke 13 verse 27. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of what? Of iniquity, adikia. So let me ask you, is adikia synonymous with anomias? Yes or no? Is iniquity synonymous with lawlessness? As you compare these two verses, it's the same saying of Jesus, but he uses a different word. 
So when the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy, Timothy 2.19 that the seal is to depart from what? From iniquity. What it means is that the seal is to depart from what? From lawlessness. So does the seal have anything to do with the law of God? It most certainly does. I want you to notice also point number five. The third angel's message makes a contrast between those who worship the beast and those who keep the commandments of God. Obviously they are opposites because in Revelation 14 verse 11 it says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So you have one group that worships the beast, his image, and receives the mark. In the very next verse, you have the contrasting group. And it says there in verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who what? Who keep the commandments of God. So keeping the commandments of God is the opposite of what? Of worshiping the beast. Because these two verses are in succession and they contrast each other. So are you understanding this first, uh, this first ripple, the largest ripple? The final controversy is going to have to do with what? With what? With God's law. But now let's be a little more specific. Let's look at the, at the circle that goes towards the stone that you threw into the lake. The smaller circle shows us that the final conflict is going to be over the first table of the Ten Commandments. In other words, the first four commandments primarily. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, and of course we'll continue reading all the way through verse 8. It says, oh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Is that a summary of the first table of the law? <clears throat> you remember in Matthew 22, Jesus said that uh, this is the first and the great commandment, summarizes the first four commandments. And then notice the verses that we have following. It says, and these words, which I command you today, shall be where? In your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a what? As a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Does it have to do with the first table of the law? That's the context. Now, did you notice here that it says that, that they will be a sign on the hand and as frontlets between your eyes? Does that sound familiar? In Revelation, do we, what does the mark of the beast, where is it placed? It's placed on the right hand or where? On the forehead. Now, you say, well, you know, there's not exactly a comparison because this is talking about God's people having the, the you know, the, the seal on the forehead or on the right hand. But let me, let me explain this. Did you notice that in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says that God's people have the sign on their forehead and on the hand, and on the hand. In Revelation chapter 14, 13 and 14, it says that people receive the mark either on the forehead or on the hand. That is an important distinction we're going to notice. So God's people uh, will have, will, will follow the, the, the Sabbath because of conviction, and also they will follow the Sabbath because, uh, because they don't fear uh, not being able to work or not being able to buy or sell or, or being subject to the death decree. Now let's go to point number two. The issue at the end of time has to do with worship. The last six commandments have to do with horizontal relationships. We've dealt with that before between human beings. While the first four commandments describe the vertical relationship with God. Is that clear? So is the final conflict uh, mainly over the issue of worship? Let's notice Revelation 13 verse 4. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? 
Revelation 13, verse 8, verse 12, and verse 15. All who dwell on the earth will worship Him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Verse 12, And He exercises all the authority of the first beast in His presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to what? There it is again. To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 15, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Killed. Do we find the issue of worship in uh, the third angel's message as well? Notice Revelation 14 verses 9 and 11. Then a third angel followed them saying, with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, uh, and then notice verse 11, And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Is the final controversy over worship? Yes, worship of God. Is that a summary of the first four commandments of God's law? Do the first four commandments have to do with worship? They most certainly do. Notice point number three. By the way, that was point number two. Point number three. Chapter 13 speaks of false worship to the beast and his image and receiving the mark. In contrast, Revelation 14, 6, and 7 commands God's people to worship the Creator. Do you notice the, the contrast there? Uh, the, uh, the wicked people worship the beast. God's people, according to the first angel's message, worship the Creator. Does that have to do with the, with the fourth commandment, with the first table of the law? Certainly. In fact, notice this summary that we find at the top of the page. You know, you can read the first angel's message. The last part says, And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. But I want you to notice that the first four commandments are specifically involved in the final controversy. Does the beast demand worship? So does the beast claim to be God? So does that involve the first commandment? Yes. Does the beast from the earth make an image and command everyone to worship the image? What commandment is that? The second, thou shalt not make any image, right? We're told that, that the, the individuals who follow the beast and the beast itself blasphemes the name of God. What commandment is that? It's the third commandment. And by enforcing Sunday, we find that it's an attack on the Creator. Which commandment is that? The fourth commandment. You have all of the text there to show that the issues deal primarily with the first four commandments of God's holy law. Are we doing well so far? So we've noticed the broadest circle. The conflict is over God's law. Then we've noticed the smaller circle. The conflict is over the first table of the law. But now we're going to take a look at the fact that this conflict is over one specific commandment in the first table of the law. So let's pursue this. This is going to take most of our time. Point number one, the testimony of Scripture. Why do we worship God? Well, let's notice Psalm 95 and verse 6. Psalm 95, verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our what? Maker. Why do we worship God? Because God is what? God is the creator. Notice Nehemiah 9 verse 6 presents the same idea. Nehemiah 9 verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything in it the seas, and all that is in them. And you preserve them all, the host of heaven, what? Worships you. Why does the host of heaven worship the Lord? Because God made everything. So, so we worship God because God is the creator. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 presents the same idea. We worship God because He's the creator. Notice, we're going to read the first angel's message. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. 
saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Is worship connected with uh, the Creator? We worship God because He is the Creator. Let's go to one other text. Uh, this is on the next page. Then we'll come back to uh, Exodus 20, verse 11. Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. When God recreates or creates a new heavens and a new earth, uh, which day are we going to keep in honor of the new creation? The Sabbath. Notice Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass, see it's speaking about the new creation, right? And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and some people get all hung up over that, basically what it means, the new moon marked the beginning of the month. So it means from one month to another. You know, in the Spanish version it says de mes en mes, from month to month because the new moon marked the beginning of the month. You say, well, why are we going to go every month? Well, because Revelation 22, verse 2 says that we need to go every month to eat from the tree of life. So the book of Revelation explains the reason why we're going to go monthly, and uh, Isaiah also says we're going to go weekly because it's the commemoration of the new creation. So notice verse 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all the Jews... Oh, thank you very much. All flesh, so if you have flesh, you're going to go, and if you're saved. <laughs> and all flesh shall come to what? To worship before me, says the Lord. So once again, worship is connected with the fact that God is the creator. Is that clear? We provided four verses, which make it very clear. Now, has God made a sign that he is the creator? Where did God establish that sign? At Mount Sinai, right? No. Where did He establish the sign that He's the Creator? You can't speak of worship without speaking about the sign that God made where we show that we worship Him. Notice Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, going back to the previous page. Exodus 20, verse 11. This is the fourth commandment of God's law, and God says, work six, and rest the seventh, because I worked six, and I rested the seventh. You know, that would be a, a ridiculous commandment if the days of creation were millions of years. How could God tell us, you work six and rest the seventh like I did, if God did not uh, work six literal days and rest on the seventh literal day? By the way, do you know that Francis I and John Paul II have gone on the record saying that this world came into existence by a long process of evolution. And uh, Malachi Martin in his book, The Jesuits, really is aggravated at this new teaching in the Roman Catholic Church because he says the Roman Catholic Church never used to teach that. The Roman Catholic Church used to believe in a literal creation. Interesting that a Jesuit would say that. You know, Malachi Martin was a Jesuit, but he really hates what the Jesuits are doing now. Uh, I wish he was still alive so that he could see uh, how the Roman Catholic Church has really gone downhill and has become very, very liberal in its theology. The Catholic Church has the same controversy that is going on in the Adventist Church, but, uh, you know, not over the same issues. But you have liberals and conservatives. You have those who say the Pope should be talking more about gay marriage and abortion and all these things. But Francis never talks about those things anymore. Now it's, it's climate change and it's poverty because that's what the rulers of the earth want uh, want him to talk about. And so he wants to get them in his pocket. He already has basically evangelicals and Protestants in his pocket, so he says, now I need to get the worldlings in my pocket, and then I'll have everybody, and then I'll be able to do what I did in the past. So notice, uh, once again, it says uh, in Exodus 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So when did God establish the Sabbath as the sign of creation? He established it at the very beginning, where there was no sin, there was no Jew. God blessed and sanctified the Sabbath at creation. And that's what you find on the next page, Genesis chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, tells us, and on the seventh day, 
God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then, after he rested, it says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So was the seventh day the sign of the Creator? Absolutely. Does God say in the fourth commandment that when we observe the Sabbath, we, we are going back to creation and we are honoring the Creator by keeping His day holy? Absolutely. Now, I want you to notice also in um, Romans chapter 4, verse 11, that the word sign and seal, the word sign and seal are used interchangeably. It says there in Romans 4, 11, it's talking about circumcision, but I'm using this text in principle. Uh, it says about Abraham, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. So are sign and seal interchangeable? That's the point that I want us to notice. Yes. And the word seal here is the same word seal that we find in the book of Revelation. Well, it speaks about the seal of God. Now you say, why do you bring this up that, uh, you know, the word sign and seal are the same thing? Because in Exodus 31 in verse 17, where it's addressing the Sabbath, we find that God tells Israel, uh, and hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a what? They will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So the Sabbath was given to Israel as a what? As a sign. Now, what is argued many times by Protestants, they say, well, yeah, it says that God gave the Sabbath to Israel as a sign. But see, He gave it to the Jews. He didn't give it to us. Well, my answer to that is that God gave all of the Ten Commandments to Israel. Did He give the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me to Israel? So that's only for the Jews. Did He give the one, uh, don't make any image or bow before the image to Israel? Yeah, so that's only for them. Uh, did, did He give Israel the commandment, you shall, have, uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain? Well, yeah, so that's only for Israel. Uh, did He give the commandment, you shall not, uh, you, or honor your father and your mother to Israel? Yeah, well, so that's only for Israel. He gave all of the Ten Commandments to Israel. So why do they say the Sabbath is exclusively for Israel, but all the rest of the commandments are for everybody? Right. It doesn't make any sense. He gave the whole Ten Commandments to Israel because that was his people at that time. But he gave them to the whole human race. I don't think any evangelical would say that it's okay to kill or commit adultery or to steal because the Ten Commandments were given to Israel. The Sabbath is a sign. And by the way, if you continue reading here in uh, Ezekiel, uh, or ra rather Exodus 31 and verse 17, you're going to notice that God refers back to creation. He says, I gave you this sign because in six days I made the heavens and the earth and I rested on the seventh day. So uh, this argument that uh, God gave it to the Jews and so it's only for the Jews doesn't hold water because God gave all of the Ten Commandments to the Jews and the Sabbath was the sign between God and His people. Notice also Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Once again, the same idea that the Sabbath is the sign between God and His people. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know what? That I am the Lord your God. So the Sabbath is a sign that God is our God. He's the Creator God. Now let me touch on another point. If you read Psalm 24 and verses 1 and 2, you have a very interesting uh, statement there. And I think probably you've read this, uh, these two verses uh, many times. Let's take a look at them. Psalm 24 and verses 1 and 2. It says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. To whom does the world and everything in the world belong? It belongs to God. Why? Why does everything in the world belong to God? Well, verse 2 tells us. It says, For He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So 
Everything that exists in the world belongs to God because God what? Because God created it. Who created the Sabbath? So to whom does it belong? See, people speak out of both sides of their mouth. They say, you ask them, to whom does the world belong? Oh, to God. Uh, to whom does everything in the world belong? Oh, to God. Oh, we're good. Why? Well, because He created it all. What else did He create? So why, how can you say that when He made the first six days is His because He made it, but He made the Sabbath and that's not His. That belongs to the Jews. In order to belong to the Jews, the Jews would have had to have made it. Are you with me? Now, so, so Ezekiel 20 verse 12 tells us that the Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel. Now, let's notice also Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 16 and 17. Uh, this is a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting passage that we have here. Uh, let's read verses 16 and 17. It says, So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Where is this happening? It's happening in the Lord's house. And who are the primary ones that are, that are uh, practicing this abomination? The religious leaders, folks. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men, that's the leaders of the people, by the way, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. God's own people are worshiping what? The sun. And then in verse 17 it says, And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations? That's a key word. Is that in Revelation 17? The harlot commits abominations? Yes. To commit the abominations which they commit here, for they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. That's the wrath of God that is going to be poured out upon Israel. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Now let me ask you, was everybody practicing this abomination of worshiping the sun? No. Was there a group that sighed and cried because of the abominations that were being committed among God's people? Notice Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done in it. And what is the greatest abomination? The greatest abomination is the worship of the what? The worship of the sun. And do you know, Jeremiah tells us that the reason why Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians is because the people were not keeping the Sabbath. Notice Jeremiah 17, verse 27. Jeremiah 17, verse 27. God says, But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. So are you catching the picture? The people in Israel were worshiping the sun, which is called the greatest abomination, because God in Ezekiel chapter 8 gives, uh, uh, categorizes the abominations. The greatest is the worship of the sun. But not everybody was worshiping the sun. There were those who were sighing and crying because of the abominations that were being practiced among God's people. And what did those people receive? They received a mark where? On their foreheads to preserve them from the general ruin that would come upon Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the city. Now, is this idea picked up in the book of Revelation? It most certainly does. In chapter 7, you have the four winds that are being held. What's going to happen when the four winds are released? Oh, you're going to have a cataclysmic end to world history. In other words, the world is going to fall apart. Destruction is going to come. What it happens before the destruction comes? There's an angel that comes from heaven with a seal in his hand, and he's going to seal the servants of God on their foreheads. Are God's people going to be crying out because of the abominations that are being committed? Read Revelation 18, 1 to 3. 
a mighty angel descends from heaven and he cries with a loud voice, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. There you have the loud cry. There you have the crying out over the abominations. The word abominations is actually used there in Revelation chapter 18. So is going to God going to have a faithful remnant at the end of time who are faithful to God and will sigh and cry because of the abominations they are being committed among those who profess to be God's people? Absolutely. And why was Jerusalem destroyed? Because they were trampling the Sabbath. Do you suppose there's any parallel to that at the end of time? Now somebody might say, well, Pastor Bohr, but uh, you know, it's not the same to worship the sun as it is to worship on Sunday. And in principle, I say, yes, it is the same. And let me explain the reason why. Let me ask you, who created the sun? God did. Did he create the sun as an object of worship? No. So what happens if you make the sun an object of worship? What is that called? Idolatry. Idolatry. Now who made the first day of the week? Did he make it for worship? So what happens if man converts it into a day of worship? It's idolatry. It doesn't matter whether it's an object or a day. Whatever man makes for worship that God did not make for worship is idolatry. So in principle, worshiping on the first day of the week, which God did not create for worship, and worshiping the sun, which God did not create for worship, in principle, basically, it is the same thing. Notice this statement from Ellen White in Great Controversy, page 452. The seal of God's law is found in the fourth commandment. This only of all the ten brings to view both the name and title of the lawgiver, it declares him to be the creator of the heavens and the earth, and thus shows his claim to reverence and worship above all others. Aside from this precept, there is nothing in the Decalogue to show by whose authority the law is given. When the Sabbath was changed by the papal power, the seal was taken from the law. The disciples of Jesus are called upon to restore it by exalting the Sabbath of the fourth commandment to its rightful position as the Creator's memorial and the sign of His what? The sign of His authority. So are you seeing the connection between the book of Ezekiel and what's going to happen at the end of time? I mean, it's, it's just absolutely clear that there's a parallel between these two and that it involves worship and that it involves the sign of worship to the Lord. So that's our first point. Our first point then uh, is that uh, the testimony of Scripture tells us that we worship the Creator and God has established the Sabbath as the sign that He is the Creator. When we keep the Sabbath, we are showing that we worship the Creator, that the Lord is our God, as we noticed. Now there's a second point that uh, deals with this issue of why the final conflict has to do with the fourth commandment specifically. And that is the testimony of analogy. You know, evangelists use the analogy of the presidential seal of the United States. Uh, the presidential seal has what? Three elements. It has the name of the functionary. It has the office of the functionary and the territory over which the functionary uh, governs. Uh, for example, the presidential seal says uh, Barack Obama. That's his name. His office is president, and the territory is the United States of America. What is the only commandment that has all three of those elements of a seal? The fourth commandment. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 307, states, The fourth commandment is the only one of all the ten in which are found both the name and title of the lawgiver. It is the only one that shows by whose authority, that is of the Creator, the law is given. Thus it contains what? The seal of God affixed to His law as evidence of its authenticity and binding force. So the testimony of analogy is a good thing. Then we have the testimony of archaeology. The testimony of archaeology. And uh, this is really exciting. Several years ago, uh, many, many years ago, I was studying at the seminary at Andrews and when there was spring break or a break for Christmas or so on, I would, I would take advantage and go to the library, uh, the James White Library, which is huge. It has the, the theological library just is uh, 
a dream because <laughs> it's got thousands and thousands of volumes. And so I would go, I would go to all of the uh, shelves and I would look at the books and, uh, you know, when I found a book that, uh, that appealed, to my, uh, you know, appealed to me, uh, I would take the book and I would leaf through it to see if there was anything that I thought I could use later on in my ministry and then I would go to the photocopier and I would copy the pages that, that I really uh, felt I could use. And uh, I remember as I was going through the library, I found these great big green books. I mean, they were huge. And uh, I don't know why I was attracted to them. The, the name of the, the series of volumes is Ugaritica. You know, in, in ancient times, there was a language called Ugaritic. And so I said, well, this is interesting, Ugaritica. So, so I uh, actually were prepared by, in French, but they had bunches of pictures of archaeological discoveries. So I started leafing through, through one of these books, and something suddenly arrested my attention. And that is that there were several pages where you had, uh, you had a tablet and, on, and the tablet was written on both sides. The same material was written on both sides of the tablet, on the front side and on the back side. Uh, they were clay tablets. And I noticed that right in the center of the tablet, by the way, at the break, if you want to get, I have some pictures in my file that I can show you which are very interesting of different tablets. Uh, they were discovered in, in Canaan, uh, in the city of Ugarit. But anyway, uh, right in the center of the tablet, impressed upon the clay when it was wet, when it was soft, you have this great big seal right in the middle of the tablet. And, and then I, you know, I read, I, read I, I, I can read quite a bit of French because I know English and Spanish so I can work through it. I read the subtitle. And basically it said that this was a covenant. These were covenants between a great king and a lesser king. And, and that the seal impressed in the middle had three elements. It had the name of the king, it had the title of the king, and it had the territory over which the king ruled, which was the city of Ugarit. Now, some people criticize the evangelists because they say, well, you know, how can you use a presidential seal in the year, uh, you know, 2016 and say that that applies to biblical times but when you discover that this actually was something that was done back then it becomes much more significant now let me go through this evidence very quickly were the Ten Commandments God's covenant with his people yes were they written on tablets yes were the tablets written on both sides that's a, that's a fact that many people don't know about. The Ten Commandments were written on both sides. We're going to read the verses in a minute. Where would you expect to find the seal if the Ten Commandments are being given around the same time? You would expect to find it in the middle. Exactly. And the seal, as I mentioned, contained the name, title, and territory of the sovereign. Let's notice all of the characteristics from Scripture. The Ten Commandments are a covenant. Notice Deuteronomy 4, verse 13. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. So were the Ten Commandments written on tablets? Yes, on stone, because God wanted to express their permanence. Uh, notice also um, what we find in Exodus chapter 32, 15, and 16. They were written on both sides. It says, And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written what? on both sides. On the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And uh, why, why do you think that in antiquity at this same time period they would write the same material on the front and on the back of the tablet? It's very simple because when you impress the seal in the middle of the front side of the tablet the writing was obliterated so you could turn the tablet around and you could read the contents on the other side. Interesting. I'll show you some pictures during the break. It's fascinating. See, archaeology confirms Scripture, and it also confirms the spirit of prophecy. Now, does the Sabbath commandment contain all of the elements of a seal, the only commandment? Yes. Notice Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. 
you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates for that is because in six days the Lord is that his name the Lord made is that his function or his office he's the creator the heavens and the earth and the sea is that his territory yes and all that is in them and rested the seventh day therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it did God create the Sabbath as his sign that he is the creator yes. absolutely do we find all of the elements of a seal in the fourth commandment yes there's plenty of biblical evidence for all of this folks the Bible is clear that the final conflict is going to be over the Ten Commandments. It's going to be over the first four commandments, and more specifically, over the fourth commandment. There's one text that I did not include here, and I'm going to include it in future syllabuses, because the thought just came to me this morning. Let's go to Exodus chapter 16, and then we'll, we'll look at the testimony of history to see if history corroborates uh, what we've been saying. Go with me to Exodus chapter 16, uh, which contains the manna episode. Ellen White says that at the end of time, the Sabbath is going to be a test to see if people are willing to keep God's holy law. Have you ever uh, read that in the Spirit of Prophecy? Now, let me ask you, was the manna a test for Israel to see if they would walk in God's holy law? Yes. yes. It was a sign that they would be willing to walk in all of His law. Exodus 16, and notice verse, uh, verses 1 to 3. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, uh, all that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger and then notice verse 4 then the Lord said to Moses behold I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may The New King James says that I may test them. Was, the, was Sabbath observance a test? Yes. yes, that I may test them. And what was it a test of? That I will test them whether they will walk in my law or not. <laughs> so is the Sabbath a test of whether people are going to keep God's law or not? Yes. Absolutely. And then you'll notice later on in the chapter that people go out and what do they do? Oh, they go out and they gather on the wrong day and and God says to them how long is it going to be that you will not keep my commandments and my laws so very clearly Exodus tells us that the Sabbath was a test for God's people by the way do you know in the most holy place the Sabbath was highlighted you say really the Sabbath was highlighted have you ever read in the writings of Ellen White where she says that she saw uh, the tables of the law and the Sabbath commandment had a halo around it. It was highlighted. You know, if you look at the sanctuary service, you have two things in the Ark of the Covenant that teach Sabbath observance. You have the fourth commandment. The tables of the law are inside the Ark. And you have the manna, which taught Sabbath observance in two ways in the most holy place. God is teaching the importance of the Sabbath. And listen, folks, let me ask you this. Was the earthly sanctuary a shadow or a copy of the heavenly? Yes. So does the heavenly have the pot of manna? Does the heavenly have Aaron's rod that budded? Does the heavenly have the tables with the Ten Commandments? Absolutely. So is the Sabbath still binding according to the book of Hebrews? Read chapter 9. It most certainly is. Now let's go to our final testimony, the testimony of history. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Papacy confirms this fact that they have changed the law of God. They have changed Sabbath to Sunday. By the way, does the Bible say that that was going to happen? We've studied this in previous sessions. Daniel 7 verse 25, speaking about the little horn, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. 
shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change what? Times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. Now you know all of these uh, quotations that Roman Catholic scholars have. In the syllabus on Daniel, I have page after page after page after page of quotations from Roman Catholic writers as well as Protestant writers where they say that the new day of worship is Sunday because Jesus resurrected on that day. And there are many statements where the Roman Catholic Church bold-facedly says, we were the ones who changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday. So history proves what we've been talking about. Let's read a few of these statements. John Gilmary Shea, he was an important Roman Catholic historian who lived from 1824 to 1892. He states this, For ages all Christian nations looked to the Catholic Church, and as we have seen, the various states enforced by law her ordinances. Interesting that he would say the state enforced her ordinances as to worship and cessation of labor on Sunday. Protestantism, in discarding the authority of the church, has no good reason for its Sunday theory, and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. The state, in passing laws, see, he's, say, he's basically saying the Roman Catholic Church used the civil power to do this. The state, in passing laws for the due sanctification of Sunday, is unwittingly acknowledging the authority of the Catholic Church and carrying out more or less faithfully its prescription. The Sunday as a day of the week set apart for the obligatory public worship of Almighty God is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. Interesting statement. Here's another one from our Sunday visitor. Protestants accept Sunday rather than Saturday as the day for public worship after the Catholic Church made the change. There's a key word. But the Protestant mind does not seem to realize that in accepting the Bible, in observing the Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church, the Pope. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, this individual was uh, this, this publication was the most influential Roman Catholic journal in the United States at the time when this was written. Uh, then you have Louis G. Segur. He was a French Catholic prelate and apologist and later a, a diplomatic and judicial official at the court of Rome. He lived from 1820 to 1881 and he stated this, Question, what Bible authority is there for changing the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day of the week? Who gave the Pope the authority to change the command of God? Answer, it was the Catholic Church, which, by the authority of Jesus Christ, that's the questionable part, has transfer, transferred this rest to Sunday, to the Sunday. Thus, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. <laughs> so what are Protestants doing? They're paying homage to the Catholic Church. Notice what the Catholic Encyclopedia has to say. Question, what is the third commandment? <laughs> By the way, it's the fourth. Um, answer, the third commandment, which is really the fourth, is remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, the Catholic Church, after what? There's the key word in the book of Daniel. After changing the day of rest from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept as the Lord's day. See, they don't hide it. Notice what Thomas Enright had to say. He was for many years the president of Redemptorist College in Kansas City, Missouri, in a lecture that he gave at Hartford, Kansas, February 18, 1884, he stated this, Prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day, 
and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, listen to this, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent, reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Wow. Cardinal Gibbons, the, the, um, actually from the office of Cardinal Gibbons, we have uh, this uh, interesting quotation which is many times used by, um, by evangelists in the Adventist Church. Uh, the question was asked whether uh, Sunday is uh, Roman Catholic Church creation. And uh, the answer was sent, and the answer was this. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. So they themselves are saying that Sunday is what? The mark of their ecclesiastical authority. Uh, one more quotation, and then I'm going to come back to one other point uh, in our next session regarding this particular issue of the mark of the beast. A word about Sunday. God said, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. Why then do we keep Sunday holy instead of Saturday? The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants who say that they go by the Bible and the Bible only, and that, it, that they do not believe anything that is not in the Bible, must be rather puzzled by keeping by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible. So, without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. <laughs> is this clear? So let me ask you, what is the seal of God? The seal of God is the Holy Sabbath. What then would the mark of the beast be, which is the opposite of the seal of God? You know, it doesn't take the mind of King Solomon to figure it out. You don't have to be Albert Einstein to figure it out. If the Sabbath is the seal of God, the sign of the Creator, then it must be true that the mark of the beast is the sign of the one who claims to occupy the position of the Creator. And in our next session, I'm going to give you evidence that the papacy claims to occupy the place of the Creator, and that's the reason why they claim that they have the right to change God's law, because they claim the power and prerogatives of God. We'll deal with that in our next session. Visit SecretsUnsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.